I'm going to start, I'm going to finish, actually, the way that we started. Um, she invited us, she, on the first day, to sit. She sat here and invited us because it felt like a circle and to kind of invite us to come in. And so I want to do that a little bit today as we close this incredible uh, few days of really inspiring, awe-inspiring talks. And so I want to sit in a circle, take a deep breath, and I want to take us home, um, kind of take us back to the reason that we're, we're all here and talk about nature and its powerful, powerful portal to awe and altruism. So I'm going to start, um, I'm an explorer, a lifelong athlete, lifelong wanderer, and not all who wander are lost. I propose that all who wander, it's actually the place where we get found. So this is Alaska, and this is, I want to talk about awe a little bit, and they've been studying awe, this emotion, for about 15 years now, and it's described as the emotional response to a vast stimuli, something that we don't understand, and it's often, we often articulate with the whoa or ah, like it actually comes out of our mouths. It's, it's this body experience of something that's so incredible, something like the northern lights, like I experienced here on my bike. Hopefully you felt a little bit of that. When you came to Sun Valley and in this area and you looked up at our mountains, you did a little bit of a, ah. Oh. That's actually an emotion that's been studied. And um, our brains and our DNA are actually wired to seek these kind of transcendent experiences. And we keep wanting to go back to them again and again. I want to share a little bit of a recent story in Alaska, and I didn't really have the words or the science to articulate this, but this was one, one time um, a few years ago in the middle of Alaska, self-supported on my bike, traveling through winter on the infamous Iditarod Trail, and I was alone. I hadn't seen any people or any, any animals for... I don't know, a couple of days, and in the middle of that night with my headlamp shining, the snow was really firm, I was riding fast, I was having a great time, and all of a sudden I noticed that there were footprints, wolf prints, next to my bike tracks that you see up there. And I stopped, and I wasn't afraid. I didn't feel alone at all. I felt excited. I felt like I was part of something really big. And all of a sudden the wolf started howling, and so I did what any normal person would do, I started howling too, and looking up at the sky and just, oh, like I couldn't help it. It was so incredible. This is awe at its finest. And I felt part of something really, really big. And I didn't feel alone at all. And this is the concept that um, scientists call the small self effect. And obviously, you've all seen this image, um, the blue marble. It's one of our first images of Earth from space. And this inspired global awe and really impacted the feeling of the small self. But this first time that humans could see, pulled back where we are on this tiny planet and imagine, oh my gosh, like I am one part of this gigantic thing. This photo was really famous. And, and also Dr. Sylvia Earle, who is here, she also gave us a really beautiful vision of awe by showing us what's under the ocean and what's in there. But so how do you experience awe if you're not an explorer, if you're not an astronaut? How do you find everyday awe? And Galen Rowell was um, what some people claim is the, first, the world's first adventure photographer. And he took a lot of beautiful photos in the 70s and 80s. And the difference with his nature photography was that he put himself, because he was a climber, he's a mountaineer, he put himself in the images. And he showed us what people looked like in nature. And this really spawned people going outside, the Sierra Club, all these places, and people going, ah, oh, I could be in nature and experience that awe. And I, lo I love these, his photos because he really put us there. Um, and he was the first one to do it. It doesn't seem like a big deal now because we see these kind of images all over, but he put us there and he put us, instead of looking at the blue marble or at the sea, um, he put us more on a level of, oh, I can see the trees, I can see the rocks, I can see the flowers, I can put myself there. And so finding awe, everyday awe, it really is that simple at looking at something in nature. And what science has shown us in the studies of awe is that nature is one of the most reliable portals, access points to awe, to get that feeling of, I'm part of something. I'm part of something magical that I don't totally understand. Um, 
Often we say we go outside to turn, I'm going outside to turn my brain off. It's actually not turning your brain off. A certain part of your brain, yes. Um, but what we're really turning on is the limbic part of our brain. And that's our feeling, our intuition, love. And so when we go outside, we actually turn our brains on. So nature and neurobiology. So when you go outside, the taste, the smell, the sound, the shapes, they actually affect your brain and they, they release serotonin, which makes you feel good. If you want a double impact, you move in nature. And typically we are. When we go outside, we're walking, we're moving. So you go out and you move in nature. And that's going to release dopamine, epinephrine. That makes you feel excited. And if you really want the triple whammy, you take somebody with you in nature. And then you're also releasing oxytocin, which is bonding, togetherness. So it's a very powerful chemical cocktail that we have access to ourselves, going outside, moving, taking a friend. Our brains and our DNA are wired for us to want these experiences again and again and again. It's basically modern knowledge that's proving um, ancient practices that have been known forever. So nature's influence on altruism. So we know that nature is good for us on a cellular, cellular level, but how is it good for the world? So um, that effect of feeling small, it actually encourages us to do something big. And I'll share a little bit of a story. This is, this is uh, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. I did the most important ride of my life, 1,200 miles on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And I went there to find the place where my dad's plane was shot down in 1972, where he died when I was young. And I did a big ride, a big, arduous physical journey. And um, it was mostly about me for a lot of it. But the deeper I got into the jungle, the further I got away from home and technology, the more immersed I got. And actually, the shift changed from me, and it changed to what was going on outside and what was around me. And what I saw were unexploded ordnance and bombs left from a war that ended 50 years ago and a beautiful jungle and amazing people. And all of a sudden, I was inspired to do something, to help them, to clear the bombs, to be part of the solution. And this is altruism at work. And it is proven that, that when we go outside, we want to be more altruistic. There's a cool study where they had students look, a group of people look up at the trees and a group of people look at a wall at a university. And then someone dropped a bunch of pens. And the people who were looking up at the trees were more apt to stop and help and pick up the pens more quickly than the people who were not looking at the trees. I really love that. I think it's a really cool, cool kind of study. Again, showing what we know intuitively, but really showing us the importance of doing this. And, you know, like Galen Rao, unlike Galen Rao's photographs where you're, you look at a photograph, you feel awe. This experience of full immersion for me in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, the full immersion, it actually, I experienced awe, but I also wanted to take action. And that's the really cool part that happens when you fully immerse yourself in nature. So altruism. It's simple, it can look like a high five, like this. It can be clearing bombs along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, like I do with my foundation. Um, it can be taking people on bike rides, like I do with my foundation. Um, and it can be small and big, but what happens is our brains and DNA want more of it. So the more that we do, the more we want it. And the more we go in nature, the more we want to go in nature. The more we help people, the more we wanna keep helping people. Children even model this behavior when they see it. And so, I know from these talks, we're all a little bit tired and the work ahead of us is really quite daunting and there's not a lot of time. It's a lot harder than riding the Ho Chi Minh Trail or riding in Alaska or any of the, the physical stuff that I've ever done. It's, it's really quite daunting. So what do we do? How do we stay energized? How do we regenerate ourselves so that we can regenerate the earth? Well, the answer, we have to go to nature again and again and again, and we have to go with each other, and then we have to do it again to keep reinforcing the reason why we're here. And so I'll end with, um, with a quote, and this is a friend of mine, Dr. Terry O'Connor. <sighs> Terry is, um, 
the late Terry O'Connor, who's a local hero, global hero in climate health, in, um, he just did so much. He died in avalanche a couple of months ago, and he shared this quote with me like a week before, a week before he was taken. And I've always, like, I was blown away by Terry. He was, like, speaking in Dubai. He was teaching college uh, classes about um, health care and climate health care and going and saving people everywhere, all over the world, plus going skiing and bagging all these peaks all the time. And you're like, how did he do it all? And what he's taught me, as much as I'm outside, is that we have to keep going back. We have to regenerate ourselves again and again and again. And that's how he did it all, is he kept going to nature. He kept going to the place that heals and teaches us. So I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes. We're just gonna wrap this thing up. I'd like you to close your eyes, take a deep breath, I'd like you to visualize your most favorite, favorite nature place. And just think about yourself. Every morning, I awake, torn between a desire to save the world and an inclination to savor it. This makes it very hard to plan the day. <laughs> but if we forget to savor the world, what possible reason do we have for saving it? In a way, the savoring must come first. So as you open your eyes and you look around the room, I invite you to please savor so that we have the strength to continue to save.